Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shabnam Nasir. I'm a medical team leader in the Division of Anti-Infectives here at Cedar FDA. And today I'll be talking about safety considerations in clinical drug development. Here are our learning objectives. We want to try to understand that protection of subjects comes first um, when trying to design early clinical studies and to learn some key safety considerations in the conduct of phase one trials and also understand the principles of safety monitoring and reporting in clinical trials. Here are the objectives of phase one trials. We want to assess the safety and tolerability of the drug product, try to attempt to characterize dose limiting adverse reactions determine the maximum dose that's associated with an acceptable safety profile, characterize PK parameters, and explore drug metabolism and drug interactions. The subjects in phase one trials uh, generally tend to be healthy volunteers that have um, less confounding factors because they tend to not have medical problems or, or, or be on um, many medications. And in some patient, some instance, uh, patients can be enrolled especially when the drug is known or expected to be toxic. And an example would be um, with cytotoxic agents. Patients, of course, will have confounding factors, and there'll be more difficulty in separating disease-related manifestations from adverse reactions. Some phase one studies can also enroll special populations, especially if that information will be helpful um, for drug development, such as what happens to PK parameters um, in patients with renal impairment. Generally, when one is moving from the non-clinical to first and human studies, we have to consider what's the evidence that we have garnered so far from the non-clinical studies. For example, what's the duration and the total exposure proposed in humans, and how does that correlate with what was tested in the animals? What are the characteristics of the test drug? For example, is it a small molecule? Is it a biologic? Uh, does it have a, a long half-life? What is the disease being targeted for treatment? Because that has to be taken into consideration in the benefit risk assessment. What are the populations in which the drug will be used? Are we going to be enrolling um, women of childbearing potential or, or uh, children in the studies? And then um, again, uh, what is the uh, route of administration? Is it going to be administered topically or, or systemically? So one has to consider all of these factors. Furthermore, uh, do the non-clinical studies that have been done so far provide sufficient data to allow for the proposed clinical trials to be undertaken? What species were they studied in? Are the species appropriate and relevant to the particular drug? Were there potential target organs of toxicity identified? That's always very important. What duration was studied in the animals? Um, was the dose and route of exposure appropriate and similar to what is being proposed in human studies? Were the PK and PD assessments appropriate? Was there a dose response identified? And again, do we need any special studies in animals if one is planning to enroll children or pregnant women? It's important to keep in mind that only some toxicities that are seen in non-clinical studies will actually translate into adverse reactions in humans, while others uh, do not. So you end up having both predictable and unpredictable toxicities, and these can appear in any phase of development. Sometimes you only actually see them post-marketing. It really just depends on the size of your safety database that's available uh, pre-market. We also have to keep in mind that certain adverse reactions are subjective, and um, uh, examples of this are headache uh, or other events like hypersensitivity reactions, and they cannot really be assessed in non-clinical testing. wanted to give you an example of a predictable toxicity from the anti-infective world which, uh, where I reside. Um, and I'm sure you can find other examples in other therapeutic areas. So linazolid uh, is an antibacterial drug that was approved in the late 1990s. And at that time, it was the first member of its class. It had activity against gram-positive organi organisms, including some resistant ones, um, uh, methicillin-resistant staph Staphylococcus aureus, or MRSA. So certainly there was some therapeutic benefit that could be offered by this product. The non-clinical studies that had been conducted um, showed that there was myelosuppression, which uh, appeared to be dose and time dependent. And there was various changes in the bone marrow, which affected all three of the cell lines. But because the product had the potential to offer therapeutic benefit, further development was pursued. When um, we went into phase three trials, um, there was no evidence of myelosuppression per se, 
but there was a high rate of uh, thrombocytopenia seen in, in patients that were treated with linezolid. At the time uh, the product was approved, the prescribing information included precautions for thrombocytopenia, and the animal pharmacology sections described the hematopoietic effects uh, that were noted in the animals. After the product was approved, there were cases of myelosuppression uh, affecting all three li cell lines that were reported. For example, leukopenia, anemia, pancytopenia, and thrombocytopenia were uh, observed. So the labeling was then updated to include a warning against uh, myelosuppression. So this, uh, again, was an example of a predictable toxicity. Now here's an example of unpredictable toxicity. We had two products, both which were members of a beta-lactam class, which is a very well-known class of antibacterial drugs for which we have a lot of experience in humans. The structures of these beta-lactams, however, were modified um, to enhance the spectrum of activity. And in animals, there had been no unexpected toxicities. So both of the sponsors proceeded to conduct their phase one trials. The single dose actually went well, but then the, when they went into the multiple dose trials, subjects developed moderate to severe skin reactions, such that the product development had to be halted. <clears throat> so even though the non-clinical studies appear to be pretty benign and you don't see any adverse events, it doesn't mean that you won't see it when you um, go into humans. Next, we'll move on to the concept of a maximum recommended starting dose. There are key principles in selecting the MRSD. One is that you want to avoid toxicity at the initial clinical dose, but at the same time, you want to allow reasonably rapid attainment of the trial objectives, and usually those are tolerability and PK, so that you're not so low that it will take you uh, forever to get where your targeted dose was. Typically, we use an algorithmic approach based on what doses were given to animals and what toxicities were observed. There are some alternative doses based on animal PK and modeling, but those should be discussed uh, with FDA prior to, um, uh, prior to dosing. Some key concepts when you look at the MRSD are the no observed adverse effect level. And this is the highest dose tested in animal species that did not produce a significant increase in adverse effects compared to a control group. The second term is the HED or the human equivalent dose which is really what is the dose in animals that converts into a certain uh, milligram per kilogram dose in humans. Based on that, you would be able to come up with the starting dose. You also have to consider which animal species you use to make these calculations. Ideally, you would choose the most sensitive species, and this is a species from which you can identify the lowest HED. But in some instances, uh, you may actually want to use the most appropriate animal species because that species may be the one that has the particular target of interest. And this is especially seen with biologic drugs. Here's a schematic that shows the steps in determining the maximum recommended starting dose. And this would be uh, usually um, uh, done in, with the help of uh, uh, our colleagues at FDA from uh, pharmacology and toxicology. So first you would determine the NOEL, which is a starting point for determining a safe starting dose for new molecular entities and healthy volunteers. Again, that you would convert that into the HED. You would select the HED from the most sensitive or appropriate species and then choose a safety factor. You would then divide the HED by that safety factor to come up with the recommended, uh, maximum recommended starting dose. And the guidance for industry uh, references here, but it also be at the end for your um, convenience. What is the safety factor? It's the number which gives you a margin of safety for protection of human subjects when you're moving from animal studies to humans receiving the dose. The default factor, the default number is 10, um, but there is some degree of flexibility. Sometimes we can go higher or lower. The safety factor basically provides us uh, some reassurance that when moving from animals to humans that we're not exposing um, human subjects to any great risk. And one knows that there is variability when you move from animals to humans, and the safety factor allows for uh, that variability to be accounted for. As mentioned previously in my examples, there are uncertainties when you go from animals to humans. There can be differences in the sensitivity between humans and animals to certain products. Uh, you can have difficulty in detecting certain toxicities in animals, such as um, 
headache or myalgia. There can be differences in receptor de densities or affinities. You always have to be pre prepared for unexpected toxicities and also interspecies differences in how the product is handled. Um, you, humans and animals uh, may not always handle the product in an identical manner. When would you increase the safety factor greater than 10? So some of the, um, some of the reasons are here. If it's a brand new class and we have no prior experience with the product, the toxicities in the non-clinical studies were severe or irreversible or if they were non-monitorable. For example, if you have uh, histopathological changes but they're not monitored uh, because there are no clinical methods to monitor the toxicities or are there, there are no biomarkers, um, that could be a reason to increase the safety factor. If there's a very steep dose response curve, that may indicate a greater risk in humans. Um, if the PK is not linear, or if there's variable bioavailability because you have poor bioavailability in the animals, that may actually underestimate the toxicity in human, when you move into humans. On the other hand, um, you may actually be able to decrease the safety factor to less than 10 if you're dealing with a member of a well-characterized class of drugs, or if the toxicity that's produced is easily monitored, um, reversible, predictable, um, if there was a shallow dose response relationship, or um, if the NOEL was determined based on toxicity studies of longer duration, you may have a bit more reassurance in, in reducing the safety factor. Now let's discuss an example of a calculation of the MRST so you can get a, an idea. Here's a product for which the HED um, derived from rats was about 400 milligrams. The sponsor proposed a starting dose of 100 milligrams, so that brought the safety factor to uh, about four. The rationale provided was that this was a member of a well-characterized class of drugs, so using a factor of less than 10 was okay. They also noted that there was uh, toxicity studies in two species that were of a longer duration than what was proposed in the clinical trials and that these toxicities were readily monitorable and reversible. So it all sounded good. However, we did not agree with this rationale because we knew that members of the class had exhibited more toxicity than the parent class from which it was derived. Um, and we were also concerned that the bioavailability in animals was low and that human bioavailability could be greater leading to a risk of higher exposure in humans. So we agreed upon a starting dose um, of about 50 milligrams, um, uh, which brought the safety factor um, higher uh, to about eight. Now we'll move into some general considerations when you're doing these phase one trials. Some of the questions you have to ask yourself when you're getting ready to the, these trials are listed here. Are the clinical trial protocols designed appropriately to ensure safety and meet the stated objectives? Um, your job is to try to protect the safety of the subjects in the trial at all times. Do you have enough information about the quality of the investigational products and uh, at FDA or OPQ or um, Office of Pharmaceutical Quality and, and um, Chemistry Manufacturing Controls, they look at this information. Um, <clears throat> the quality, has the formulation been well characterized? And do we know what the impurities are? Are the route and rate of administration appropriate? Can the product be given as a bolus dose or does it have to be given as a slow infusion because the toxicities are such? What is the mechanism or mode of action? Is it a novel? Uh, mode of action, or do we know anything about similar products that act via a similar mechanism? And then um, lastly, are you expecting an off-target uh, effect? And this is a very important step if you're, um, for example, if you're dealing with a biologic drug, the mode of action um, may involve a target that's connected to multiple signaling pathways or affects a biologic cascade or cytokine release. So the mechanism of action in that case uh, will be even more um, important uh, in terms of safety considerations. So how do we determine an appropriate dose? Ideally, one subject should receive a single dose and then that's followed by sequential administration within each cohort. Uh, 
you want to ensure that there's adequate periods of observers observation between dosing so that one has the time to observe and interpret adverse reactions in the cohorts at the lower dose. And how long you observe will depend on the properties of the drugs. Um, for example, the PK properties, um, as well as how long does it stay in the system, how long is its half-life. We also learned some very good lessons from previous trials um, conducted with uh, similar products. So prior knowledge can be helpful. If the protocol for these phase one trials allows for dose escalation, you have to ask yourself whether the dose escalation is appropriate. Is it, are the uh, dose increments appropriate? Um, is it okay to double it up or go up by four times? Um, you do have to be cautious and use a slower rate of dose escalation if you have a small therapeutic window or if your animal models were not very good or if you have any particular concerns about toxicity. And there is a fair bit of flexibility here. It all depends about uh, on your product, on your target, and the toxicities that were seen in the animals. You have to ask yourself, is the amount of information before each dose escalation appropriate, and are the number of subjects at each dose uh, appropriate? It's important that the protocols have an appropriate monitoring scheme to look at clinical signs and symptoms of adverse events likely to be associated with the drug. The duration of the clinical observation should also be adequate re with respect to the stated objectives and the endpoints the anticipated response to the product, and the health-related conditions that are being studied. Sometimes uh, we do need to monitor for longer periods of time, but again, it all depends on the characteristics of the drug. <clears throat> you may need a hospital setting um, for, some, um, for some drugs that are being studied following initial dosing. If you're worried about any sort of delayed onset reactions, undetected toxicities, you want to make sure that the follow-up is long enough as well. As far as the frequency of monitoring, uh, there may be a need to observe more frequently soon after initial dosing in the first week or two. Um, and certainly, you would need follow-up visits for subjects who develop adverse events or lab, lab abnormalities. In addition to monitoring clinically for adverse reactions, uh, you would also need to monitor for lab tests. And which uh, particular lab test you order and collect the data on really depends on your drug. Again, the type of target organs of toxicity. So you may want to ask yourself, um, do the laboratory assessments, um, will they need to include routine assessment of all organ systems? Do we know enough about the drug that you may only need to assess specific organ systems, um, like liver or kidney? And are they sufficiently detailed so that you can make an assessment of whether or not the drug is causing toxicity of those specific organs? And lastly, are there stopping rules based on labor laboratory abnormalities if they reach a certain threshold? Now let's talk about safety stopping rules because these are very important. So again, it's important that the protocol has clear stopping rules for administering the drug, the enrollment, the dose escalation, and termination of the trial. Sometimes we've actually had to put INDs on hold because there were no uh, stopping rules. So again, these are changes to the protocol that are to be implemented when toxicity is observed. To be able to have stopping rules, you have to identify what might be acceptable toxicities and what are not acceptable toxicities. Since it's unlikely that you'll have a drug without any toxicities, um, it's uh, important to um, think about these. If acceptable toxicities occur, these will not result in changes in how the trial is, con is continued in terms of subject enrollment and dosing. If you have other toxicities that are not acceptable, you have to have a procedure in place uh, for what you would do with the study. Challenge question number one, um, to take a little break, which of the following is used to calculate the MRSD? Hopefully you recall, recall that the key step in this process is uh, to determine the NOEL or the no observed adverse effects level, which is A. So hope everyone got that one. 
now let's gonna we're gonna move a little bit to the actual um, evolution of safety as you go down um, further into your clinical development stage. Evaluation of safety is an evolving process. Um, it depends on the stage of the product under development. Uh, for products that are approved or marketed, the safety information is reflected in the product labeling. Um, this is also called the prescribing information, or PI. And uh, up-to-date safety information um, for uh, investigational products are listed in the IB, or the investigator brochure. And uh, <clears throat> The uh, investigator brochure will talk about what kind of information is available there. Um, so sources of safety information can be either found in the IB or the prescribing information. And the types of sources uh, can include non-clinical data, in vitro or animal data, as well as information about the structure of the product and the manufacturing process. Clinical pharmacology data can include information about PKPD, Safety information can come from those early clinical studies that we discussed from healthy volunteers and patients. But of course, probably the most pertinent information will be the data from the actual clinical trial for the same indication, as such data is generally controlled for the patient population characteristics and underlying pathologic process. You can also have uh, clinical trial data for different indications, uh, post-marketing experience, the published medical literature, and last but not least, the safety profiles of drugs in the same class. So all of these um, can be contained in the IB um, uh, and or the uh, PI. <clears throat> and the IB would actually also provide a description of possible risks and adverse uh, drug reactions to be anticipated based on prior experiences with the investigational product and with related products. Now, why is safety monitoring required in all trials? Uh, the goal um, is to identify, evaluate, minimize, and appropriately manage risk. And so this will uh, lead um, well into our discussion of adverse events ascertainment and monitoring, which is sort of the second half of my talk. What do we consider an adverse event? So according to the CFR that I have listed here, it's any untoward medical occurrence associated with the use of a drug in humans, whether or not it is considered to be drug-related. Um, this could be any unfavorable sign, symptom, disease, abnormal vital sign, um, abnormal laboratory finding, imaging, um, or any worsening of the above or constellation of the above. Adverse event can also be um, referred to an adver as an adverse experience. Some ways, um, some examples of ways that adverse events can be ascertained, including include um, spontaneously reported or observed symptoms or signs. They can be symptoms or signs reported as a result of a probe, such as a checklist or a questionnaire. These can also include uh, various types of testing of laboratory um, um, results, um, looking at CBCs, liver tests, etc. You can have um, specific safety assessments conducted depending on um, what, you're, what, you are think, what you think is important in the clinical trial, such as visual hearing, um, neurological exams, and again, um, ascertainment of vital signs. And adverse events can be um, characterized according to their severity. There's a number of severity grading scales or tables that are available to provide guidance to investigators uh, for safety monitoring and clinical trials. And, and these are um, optional tools, but um, they can be helpful. They are specific to the study population um, being looked at. So you know the, um, the grading scale will be di different depending on whether there's patients enrolled versus healthy volunteers. What is the phase of uh, product development and the product type to be evaluated? Um, in, for example, in healthy volunteers, clinical abnormalities may be represented on a scale from mild, moderate, severe, or potentially life-threatening, whereas, uh, for example, in oncology um, patients, AEs may be graded by a scale of 1 through 5, whereas 1 is mild symptoms versus uh, up to, uh, sorry, grade five, which is death related to the AE. So it really depends on your study population as well as some of the other factors I've noted. And um, 
Some of the commonly used examples are listed here. Um, it's also important to keep in mind that the term severe is not the same as serious in the classification of AEs, and so we will be talking about um, SAE uh, later in the talk. <clears throat> What happens when the AE gets uh, report gets to the sponsor? Um, there's a process of converting from the investigator's verbatim terms to the standardized preferred terms using a specialized dictionary called MEDRA. Uh, MEDRA is the medical dictionary for regulatory activities, um, and uh, it can be used to sort AEs and group like events. Preferred terms are usually what are used to calculate the incidence of AEs. And wanted to show you a structural hierarchy of the MEDRA um, system. The highest level of terminology, um, which is the least specific, is the system organ class, or SOC. And this goes down to the lowest uh, level term. <clears throat> the PT is the one that, uh, again, is, is most important, which um, because it represents a single specific medical concept. Clinical investigators actually play a pretty crucial role in the safety reporting um, because they have to try to use the most scientific and consistent terminology when reporting adverse events. And there may be significant coding problems uh, that may lead to missing safety signals. So one example is splitting, um, <clears throat> where um, if you split similar terms such as uh, hypertension or high blood pressure, it can actually result in a lower incidence or may minimize or mask a safety signal. Lumping. Uh, on the other hand, uh, lumping dissimilar terms to the same PT may also obscure a safety signal under the lumped term. So an example of this is facial edema, which uh, can be a very different type of pathophysiology from leg edema, for example. And a coding uh, issue could be that uh, one has lumped all edema to the PT edema. In the third category, there may be a lack of adequate um, term or a definition to represent a syndrome of interest, such as serotonin syndrome or uh, metabolic syndrome or uh, hypersensitivity. <clears throat> and in this case, you may actually need a prospective case definition if the syndrome um, is not well characterized by a single term, uh, especially if you're expecting uh, one of these to occur <clears throat> in your study. So here is our um, next regulatory definition, um, which is serious, not to be confused with severe. Serious adverse event, um, and uh, the CFR is listed here for more information. <clears throat> These are ones, um, AEs that result in the opinion of the investigator or sponsor to result in um, death, life-threatening event, in hospitalization or prolongation of hospitalization, a disability or birth defect, uh, congenital anomaly, or any other important medical events, which are usually those that jeopardize the patient or require intervention to prevent one of the outcomes listed above. And an example would maybe um, an allergic bronchospasm requiring intensive treatment in an ER or at home. Here's some examples of uncommon SAEs. Um, these should really raise a red flag that there may be a possibility that the AE was caused by the study drug, especially in the study population of generally healthy uh, individuals. You don't want to see one of these uh, occurring. <clears throat> While this isn't a comprehensive list, it is a good list to kind of have with you. Um, and some of them can include um, anaphylaxis, liver failure, um, seizures, uh, torsade de pont, and, and others listed here. So serious adverse events, like any other adver uh, adverse events, need to be assessed for drug-related um, causality. Um, some of the questions that you can ask yourself to determine um, this would be, is it common in the uh, population under study? Was it treatment emergent, or did it occur on treatment or shortly thereafter? Did it respond to a de-challenge or a drug discontinuation? Did it recur on re-challenge or reintroduction of the study drug? Were there any concomitant medications on board that may have contributed to it? Um, and then were there labs or tests done to characterize the adverse event further? Was there any obvious alternative cause? Um, and then lastly, is the SAE a study endpoint? So for example, was death in your study also a study endpoint? <clears throat> 
And you want to um, keep in mind that you want to uh, try to provide um, enough detail in um, relevant clinical information in the case report form to allow for a good quality narrative to be uh, generated. So now let's talk about AE reporting requirements, um, <clears throat> what the clinical investigator would report to the sponsor and the CFRs listed. And this is also discussed in, the, in a draft guidance um, for which the reference will be provided at the end. An investigator must report immediately all SAEs whether or not the event is considered drug-related. In addition, the investigator must also include an assessment of whether there is a reasonable possibility that the drug caused the event. <clears throat> for um, SAEs that are also study endpoints, they can be reported um, in accordance with the protocol. However, one exception to that is that if the study endpoint is an SAE and there's evidence suggesting a causal relationship between the drug and the event, the investigator then must immediately report the event to the sponsor. Okay, so let's talk about our first hypothetical case. <clears throat> you are the uh, clinical investigator for a trial evaluating whether antihypertensive drug A is associated with a reduced risk of death, MI, or stroke. A 75-year-old white male patient has just died in your trial. And we are told a little bit of information about the cause of death, which appears to be anaphylaxis. So the question is, do you have to immediately report this case to the sponsor? So let's think just for a minute. So we're told that death is a study endpoint, and usually SAEs that are study endpoints can just be reported per protocol. However, here we're told that the, the cause of death was due to anaphylaxis. So anaphylaxis is a pretty rare event, and as you noted on the previous slides, it's um, one to kind of ra raise a red flag that there may be a causal relationship with the drug. So now, as you have evidence to suggest a causal relationship between drug A and the event, the investigator must immediately, immediately report the event to the sponsor. So this was the, um, this is a little tricky, but I hope that um, this, this uh, explanation comes through. Now moving back to regulatory definitions, this is the one that's important for the expedited reporting of adverse events to the FDA. And the concept of unexpected adverse event is presented here. Um, there's a lot here to unpack, so the CFR may be good to, to review for this one. An adverse event is, unexpe is deemed unexpected if, if the following conditions are met. If it's not listed in the investigator brochure or IB, or if the IB is not available or required, if it's not listed at the specificity or the severity observed, uh, for example, if the IB list increased creatinine but you have a case of acute renal failure, which would be unexpected by virtue of greater severity, or if you have a, um, excuse me, a cerebral thromboembolism, that would be unexpected by virtue of greater specificity if the IB list only a CVA. If it's not consistent with risk information described in the general investigation plan or elsewhere in the current application. And then um, lastly, <clears throat> uh, also I did mention if it occurs at a higher rate than listed in the IB, that would be um, another um, reason for unexpected. And lastly, if it's mentioned in the IB as anticipated due to the pharmacological properties of the drug or if it occurred with other drugs in the class, but not with the particular drug under investigation, it would be considered unexpected. So an example would be angioedema. Um, it's, an, it's anticipated to occur in some patients exposed to drugs in the ACE inhibitor class. And angioedema would be described in the IB as a class effect, but if you have a case of angioedema observed with the drug under investigation, that would be considered unexpected for reporting purposes until it's included in the IB as occurring with the actual drug under investigation. So now let's look at a, another hypothetical case. 
Um, here you're the investigator for a clinical trial evaluating a new quinolone antibacterial drug B for the treatment of pneumonia. The investigator brochure lists a number of SAEs associated with the quinolone drugs, including essential tremor. Um, again, this is hypothetical. <clears throat> is the seizure in, in this trial um, for drug B considered an unexpected AE? So yes, seizure in this hypothetical case would be considered unexpected because the IB does not list um, um, seizure. Or you can also say that the AE um, seizure is not really at the severity um, of what's listed in the IB. Um, sorry, the, uh, the uh, seizure is at a greater severity than what's listed in the IB, which is just essential tremor. All right, so I thought that, I hope that was an illustrative case. Let's keep moving on to our next and final um, regulatory definition, which is suspected adverse reaction, or SAR. And this is an AE for which there's a reasonable possibility that the drug caused the AE. Again, reasonable possibility means that there's evidence to suggest a causal relationship between the drug and the AE for purposes of IND safety reporting. Some examples can include the following, a single occurrence of an uncommon event that's known to be strongly associated with drug exposure, for example, um, angioedema, hepatic injury, uh, a Stevens-Johnson syndrome case, or more than or equal to one occurrence of an event not commonly associated with drug exposure, but otherwise uncommon in the exposed population, for example, neutropenia in a healthy uh, subject would fit sort of into this example or an aggregate analysis of specific events observed in a clinical trial indicating that those events occur more frequently in the drug treatment arm than in a concurrent or historical control group. So for example, acute MI um, in a long duration trial with elderly cancer patients um, would, would be not so unexpected. So you would, um, you would uh, wanna have uh, an aggregate analysis of these specific events to um, <clears throat> to say that this was a suspected adverse reaction. Okay. Determination of an AE as a suspected adverse reaction can be difficult, but it's critical to avoid submission of uninformative IND safety reports. The sponsor is the one um, that evaluates all available information and decides whether there's a reasonable possibility that the drug caused the AE. So again, this is the sponsor's um, primary uh, responsibility. This slide illustrates the universe of suspected adverse reactions, which are no longer just adverse events, which are um, in the outermost sphere here. here. So these are adverse events are again, um, uh, they have undetermined causality. <clears throat> And they're not quite, uh, suspected adverse reactions are not quite established, definitively established adverse reactions that are noted in the dark red sphere in the center. So these suspected adverse uh, reactions occur in the middle here. And again, these are AEs with a reasonable possibility of drug-related causality. That is, there's evidence to suggest a causal relationship between the drug and the AE. Okay, so FDA continues to require that three criteria generally be met before a sponsor submits an IND safety report. And um, this, uh, these criteria again are that its event must be serious, unexpected, and there, may be, there must be evidence to suggest a causal relationship between the drug and the event. So all three criteria have to be met and the standard is sometimes called a, a SUSAR, serious, unexpected, suspected adverse reaction. And then again, the sponsor is the one that must uh, assess whether or not there's a reasonable possibility that the drug caused the event. The sponsor should only submit these type of IND safety reports when all three criteria are met. In addition, um, the sponsor is expected to submit an annual report to the IND, and this will include, include a summary of the most frequent as adverse events that are not reported individually, um, in addition to summarizing the SAEs. So let's talk about time reporting, timeframes for reporting. Sponsors have two timeframes when it comes to IND safety reports. Uh, 
basically those that are required to be submitted to the FDA in 15 days and those that are required to be submitted within seven days. Um, as you can imagine, the most serious ones are those that are reported within seven days. Um, there's five categories of adverse events that trigger the sponsor's responsibility to submit these. Um, so one, again, is the SUSAR that we just mentioned, serious, unexpected, suspected adverse reactions. Findings from other studies suggesting a significant risk in humans. Findings from animals or in vitro testing suggesting a significant risk in humans. An increased rate of occurrence of serious suspected adverse reactions. And serious adverse events from bioavailability or bioequivalent studies not under an IND. And so for all of these, uh, this IND safety report would be um, required within 15 days unless the adverse reaction was fatal or life-threatening, um, for which case, in, in which case the reporting would be required within seven days of submission. And there may be some um, uh, details here that you want to look at, um, and the guidance uh, on this reporting will be, again, provided at the end. Now, this is our final um, example, hypothetical case number three. In a trial of a marketed HIV drug C, an eighth-month-old infant enrolled at one month of age was noted at month four to have moderate hearing loss in a clinic progress note. Um, ototox so ototoxicity is not mentioned in the labeling of this drug class. Um, the investigator's causality assessment notes that hearing loss may be related to the study drug. So the question is, does the sponsor have to report this to FDA? And if so, can it be submitted at a, as a seven or 15-day report? So in answering this question, we have to think back to our definition about um, a serious adverse event. Uh, in this case, hearing loss is a disability, and thus it's an SAE. As hearing loss is not mentioned in the labeling, it is an unexpected event. Um, the sponsor determines that's a, that there's a reasonable possibility of relatedness to study drug. Um, we are also we're not told, but we also have information. The sponsor has information that there was an increased rate of occurrence of hearing loss on the study drug as compared to the comparator. So with all that information in mind, the sponsor um, determines that there is a reasonable possibility of relatedness to the study drug, and it qualifies as a SUSAR, and thus it should be reported to FDA. Um, as it's not fatal or life-threatening, it can be actually reported as a 15-day report. So in summary, I've provided a high-level overview of safety considerations in phase one trials, important questions to ask yourself before you decide to dose humans as you go from um, translating information from non-clinical studies to either healthy volunteers or patients. We talked about the relevance of toxicities seen in the non-clinical studies and how they translate to adverse events in humans. Um, it's important to keep in mind that they're both predictable and unpredictable adverse reactions. We discussed how to go about determining a safe starting dose in humans and the concept of the safety factor. We also discussed the importance of safety monitoring and stopping rules. And we moved on to the ascertainment of safety in larger clinical trials and important regulatory definitions of um, adverse events. Investigators play a critical integral part in assuring um, quality safety assessments by then reporting also to the sponsor. And we also learned how the sponsor <clears throat> evaluates all available safety information and, and reports to FDA and all participating investigators. So my last slide is a challenge question. An investigator would not have to report a case of hepatic failure if the investigator brochure listed elevated hepatic enzymes or hepatitis. And I think you will all get this answer. Um, this is false. Um, again, because the case of hepatic failure is at a higher um, uh, level of severity than what's listed in the IB. And with that, I thank you for your attention and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Levinson. I'm a statistician in CEDAR FDA. I'm happy to be speaking today at this clinical investigator training course. And I'll be speaking on statistical principles for clinical development.
Okay, here are my learning objectives. The, the first objective is quite broad, to understand statistical principles for the design, conduct, and analysis of clinical studies. Uh, the second two objectives are more specific, to understand the concepts of bias and variability, and to understand issues around adherence, missing data, and multiplicity. Now, naturally, in a half hour, people aren't going to go from no understanding to being experts on all this. Uh, but I hope this talk gives you a good basis of the key concepts. And I do have references throughout for uh, further learning. OK, uh, be before I uh, go too far, I'd like to define these terms on the stages of a study. Uh, and before I do that, I'm introducing my first references here, ICH E8 and ICH E9. Uh, so ICH is an organization made up of uh, regulators and industry groups from around the world. And among other things, they produce uh, guidelines on topics related to clinical trials and, and drug development. ICH E8 is on general uh, principles for clinical studies, and ICH E9 is on uh, statistical principles for clinical studies. And I provide, the more, I provide more details on these references uh, on a slide at the end. Okay, so design. Design is the conception, planning, and specification of the study. Uh, conduct is the actual running of the study. Analysis is the analysis of the study, or sort of the number crunching. Uh, and this is the part where people uh, feel the statisticians play uh, their role. Uh, but I, the point of my talk and what I'll argue throughout is statistics has a role in all these stages. And finally, there's reporting, which I won't really have anything to say about today. So here's kind of the key takeaway, maybe from the whole talk, uh, that in some ways is uh, the principle that everything else is based on here, is that design and conduct are more important than analysis. Um, in other words, analysis cannot make up for poor design and conduct. Thinking about it in sort of the positive direction, if you focus on good design and conduct, the analysis will be straightforward. Okay, there, there's a lot on this slide. Um, let me back up a bit. Um, in order to get a drug, in order to market a drug in the US, you have to demonstrate that the drug is safe and effective. You also have to demonstrate other things as well. Uh, to demonstrate a drug is effective, you need evidence from adequate and well-controlled studies. And what defines an adequate and well-controlled study is specified in federal regulations. And on the bottom is the reference to those regulations. And they're actually surprisingly readable if you ever want to look those up, if you Google though, that reference there. Uh, now, even if your goal is not to market a drug, but uh, you know, do some scientific study outside of you know, regulatory purposes, th these are good scientific principles uh, regardless. Uh, so let me go through them uh, somewhat quickly because some of them are, I'm gonna go into greater depth later. Uh, so clear objectives, summary of methods and results. So naturally when you begin a study or plan a study, you know, it should have cl clear objectives and the approaches you use should be clearly specified. Uh, the design permits a valid comparison with the control. That one is key, and I will spend a few slides on that, so let me go on. Adequate selection of patients. So that means the patients in your study should have the condition you're interested in. Uh, that seems kind of pretty straightforward, but there are cases where that, there might be challenges there. Assigning patients to treatment and control groups to minimize bias. Uh, this is where randomization comes in, and I'll return to this one as well. Adequate measures to minimize bias on subjects, observers, and analysts. Uh, this is mainly about blinding, and again, I'll, I'll return to this one as well. Well-defined and reliable assessment of subjects' responses. So this is like getting good outcomes and endpoints from your studies, and it's, it's a very important part of um, the design and conduct of a study. Uh, 
uh, and sometimes overlooked. I believe there are other talks and there's training on, on this topic, uh, and I really won't have much to say about this, but I will highlight that it's an important part of uh, the design of a study. And finally, adequate analyses to assess drug results. And that's where statistics is sort of front and center. Okay, let, let's drill down on the purpose of a control group. And here I reference ICHE10, and that's on control groups. And it's, it's an excellent document, uh, um, good reading. And th these are accessible documents, these ICH documents. Uh, so what, it, what is the purpose of a control group? Uh, almost verbatim uh, from ICHE 10, it allows for the discrimination of patient outcomes caused by the test treatment from other factors. So the alternative of having a control group perhaps is like a single arm study where you just have patients on the test treatment. And in certain circumstances, that's sufficient, but that's probably the exception. In almost all cases, a control group is needed. Uh, so without a control group and you just had the single arm and you observe that patients got better, could you attribute that to the test treatment or are there other factors? So for example, you know, people get better or worse on their own, the natural progression of the disease. Uh, you don't know if it's a test treatment or just a natural progression of the disease that's causing the improvement. Um, observer or patient expectations. You know, with a single arm, obviously people are going to know what therapy they're on, and it might just be their expectations. I am on this brand new experimental drug. I, I know I'm getting better, so it might be their expectations. And if there's any subjectivity to the outcome, and there often is, uh, there might be a bias to better results because of patients' expectations. And concomitant treatment. Uh, now, the test treatment is not the only therapy or medical intervention that patients are likely getting. Um, there's other therapy going on, and it's possible this other therapy, this background therapy, is actually, you know, result causing the effect that you're observing. Uh, so that, uh, that kind of summarizes the big purposes of the control group. So just argued that the need for control groups, but it's important that the control group is as similar as possible to the, the test drug group, except for the for the for the test drug itself. And that similarity should be both at baseline and at post baseline. And to get the similarity at baseline, that's where we use randomization. To get similarity post baseline, that's where concepts such as blinding, focusing on compliance, focusing on complete data and follow-up, and focusing on good outcome come into play. And um, I do reference ICH E8 here for a little bit more on outcome assessment. So let me go further into randomization. Uh, so I'm gonna contrast a randomized versus an observational study. And this is mainly to bring out the sort of benefits of randomization. So in a randomized study, a patient comes along and through some random process, here just for illustrative purposes shown by a flip of a coin, a patient is assigned either to drug A or to drug B. This is in contrast to an observational study where the study doesn't intervene on what drug the patient gets. So in an observational study, the, the healthcare provider in consultation with the patient uh, chooses the best drug for the patient. And that decision may be based on lab tests, it may be based on demographics and medical and family history, other drugs the patient may be taking, and also be, may be based on maybe practical things like insurance and convenience. Uh, but the, the patient's, um, the patient factors concerning the patient go into the decision of what drug they get. This, this brings uh, us to the concept of confounding. So 
without randomization, there may be systematic differences or biases when comparing people getting drug A versus people getting drug B. And this is known as confounding. So for example, uh, suppose drug A is given to older, sicker people. Uh, perhaps drug A has less side effects and is better toler tolerated. Uh, so for older, sicker people, it might be the better choice. So if you, you, even if there were, <clears throat> excuse me, even if there were no differences between the effects of drug A and drug B, uh, the comparison uh, may show that drug A has worse outcomes. Uh, so I hope this is kind of a quick motivation of the, you know, reasons and benefits of randomization. Okay, just, just a quick aside here. Um, I would hazard to say many of the studies you hear in the news are observational studies. Uh, take them with a grain of salt to say the least. Uh, as a rule of thumb, anything you hear about coffee, red wine, or chocolate, it's probably not based on strong evidence. Now, I don't wanna um, kind of bad mouth observational studies. Uh, they do have their place, they can be done well, and there are certain settings they are appropriate, then FDA does make use of them in, in important regulatory decisions. Okay, let's let's move on to blinding. Blinding is discussed in ICH E10, E8, and E9. Um, so the double blind situation. Here, patients, investigators, and study staff do not know treatment group membership. Um, so this, this minimizes differences in uh, both the patient management and the assessments, uh, both on the efficacy and safety side. Uh, so I'm not saying, not claiming that if things are unblinded, everyone is consciously biased and just trying to make the drug look as best as possible, but you know, biases are often unconscious. Uh, then that's why blinding is important. But I will say that, you know, even with blinding, patients or investigators may guess what drug they're on. There may be certain obvious side effects of a drug that makes it clear to the patient or the investigator that a uh, patient's on a particular drug. So just because you didn't tell the investigator or the patient what drug there are, you can't automatically assume that they're completely ignorant of this. Uh, so this also should sort of be accounted for in the design of the study. For example, in the, the assessments, the patient outcome assessments, you know, may be better done centrally or somebody unrelated to the management of the patient, uh, but just something to be aware of. Okay, I've, I've already used the term bias a number of times. I don't believe I've used the word variability, uh, but let me kind of make these terms more specific here. I think this is useful. So here we have these targets and the center of the target represents uh, the true value, the, the value we're kind of interested in, but you know don't know when the purpose we're doing a study to find out about. Uh, and the, the dots represent our data points. So starting in the upper left, we have low variability and low bias. So we see that the data points are generally around the center of the target, so that's low bias, and they don't have much spread, so that's low variability. Uh, moving down lower left, we have low variability but high bias. So here the data points are close together in the low variability, but they're far from the true value. So that's high bias. Uh, moving to the upper right, we have high variability that the data points are spread apart, uh, but low bias because they're generally centered around the true value. And finally, on the lower right, we have high variability and high bias. And this is of course the worst case. Um, in practice, we don't see the targets. And what that means is we don't know if we're in a bias situation, a low bias situation, or a high bias situation. We, we do see the spread of the data. So we know the variability situation and we can measure that, but we don't know if we're unbiased or in a situation with high bias. Uh, 
And that's why it's important in, in the conduct or the design and conduct of the study to do everything possible to minimize important biases. And that's why it's important to do randomization, to do good conduct with blinding and good outcome ascertainment, because bias sort of is an unknown unknown, and we want to avoid it when possible. I've spoken mainly about bias so far, but I do want to just say something about variability. Um, there are several ways or multiple ways of reducing variability. And one of probably the key ways of reducing variability is to have more sample size. So more sample size means more people in the study. So I think everyone has a you know understanding of this. So what what is a better estimate? Of the average age of this session's attendees, uh, you can pick a random sample of five attendees and calculate their average age, or you can pick a sample of 20 attendees and calculate their average age. And you know, naturally, uh, B with more attendees is going to give you a less variable estimate, irrespective of any biases. Now, in practice, it's not always possible to have uh, you know, larger and larger sample sizes, so feasibility needs to be accounted for too. So in summary about variability and bias, uh, statistics can help quantify variability in the design and analysis stage. So in the design stage, it's, it's a lot about you know, what the optimal designs are and sample sizes are. And in the analysis stage, you know, statistical methods calculate things like confidence intervals and p-values that help quantify uh, variability. Uh, design and conduct generally reduce bias, and we've already seen that you know randomization, blinding, and good good outcome assessment are generally how this is done. And finally, uh, statistical principles help reduce bias and variability at each stage: design, conduct, and analysis. Now I will speak about adherence of missing data issues. Uh, adherence of missing data are one source of bias uh, in a clinical study. Um, before I continue, uh, let me note that the material and example I use here are adapted from work of Dr. Susan Ellenberg, a renowned statistician who I believe taught this course previously. Uh, so what may happen to a patient in terms of adherence during a clinical trial? Well, the patient may stop treatment. Uh, this is not necessarily a bad thing. It may be in the best interest for a patient to stop treatment uh, because of side effects or other medical conditions. Uh, in this, the patient may stop treatment, but they may or may not be continued to be followed up in the trial. Uh, patients may leave the study in this case, what I mean is there's no more follow-up. The patient has left the study and uh, is no longer participating and cannot be followed up any further. Or, or a patient may miss an individual study visit, and that study visit might have consisted of a, of a treatment or an assessment. So what are some causes of adherence and missing data? Well, it, it might just be random, and by random, I mean it's not related to any sort of patient characteristics or the patient outcome. Uh, I mean, using an extreme case, maybe there was an earthquake in the region and the clinical site has to close down. Maybe it's related to the frailty of the patient. Perhaps uh, sicker patients are unable or unwilling to continue to be part of the study, or maybe it's related to lack of efficacy. Uh, a patient who perceives that they're not getting benefit from a therapy uh, may choose to stop therapy or may choose to uh, stop being part of the study altogether. And likewise, a patient who's uh, experiencing side effects uh, may uh, decide not to continue treatment or, or more extreme may continue, uh, decide not to be part of the study. Um, so some important points of how this all introduces bias. Um, patients with complete data may be different from those with incomplete or missing data. Uh, we saw in the last slide, well, if it's random, maybe the patients with complete data are similar to the patients with incomplete data. But if it's related to efficacy or frailty or adverse events, it's likely the patients who complete uh, treatment or complete the study are different from those who do not complete the study. 
Uh, what's a more kind of subtle point, which we probably don't have time to go into now, is treated group patients with complete data may be different from control group patients with complete data. There, there may be different reasons why treated patients drop out versus why control patients drop out. So in general, analyzing patients with complete data will likely produce biased results. Now I'm going to move on to a, a famous example that maybe demonstrates some of this and with some real data. Uh, this is um, based on a, a trial that compared clofibrate versus placebo in, in a lip, uh, to, for lipid lowering. And the outcome was mortality here. So on the bottom, you can see 18.2% of the clofibrate had mortality versus 19.4% of the placebo. This, this was a small, non-statistically significant difference. However, a significant uh, proportion of the patients on clover rate did not have uh, perfect adherence, which is, which is not surprising. So about a third of the clover rate patients had less than 80% adherence to the treatment. Uh, if you look at only those patients who had greater than 80% adherence, the mortality drops to 15%. So if you compare that 15% to the 19 or so percent of placebo, you start to see that uh, maybe the drug does have an effect. However, uh, now I reveal the whole table. Um, it looks like the placebo patients who had greater adherence have lower mortality as well. Uh, so the patients who have greater adherence are associated with lower mortality. And I'm sure we can think of many reasons why that might be the case, but uh, for, uh, for patients, whether they're in the clofibrate or the placebo arm, the mortality is 15%. So again, it's, it's pretty clear this drug does not have an effect on mortality, at least as shown by this trial. But importantly, we see that you know, patients' adherence is very much related to their outcome, uh, even on placebo. So it's, it's not the drug necessarily um, that's causing the difference in mortality, it's the differences in patients. What are adherence and missing data strategies? How do we address adherence and missing data from in clinical trials? Uh, two ICH documents are relevant here. ICH E9 on statistical principles that I already mentioned uh, discusses missing data. And ICH E9 R1, an addendum to the original I9, uh, which came out a few years ago, further discusses it. Uh, the, the, the first principle is we want to avoid missing data. So whenever possible, we want to get follow-up on follow-up data regardless of treatment adherence. Uh, so if a patient stops treatment, we still want to follow them up. There are exceptions to this, but this is sort of the general principle. Uh, it may be challenging if a patient stops treatment, they may no longer be interested in being part of the study or providing follow-up data. But whenever possible, we want to avoid missing data. Um, our general strategy is to use the treatment policy, uh, as is referred to in E9R1, or intent to treat, ITT, as is referred previously in E9. Um, in, in this strategy, uh, Patients are analyzed according to their random assignment, regardless of adherence and missing data. So we're not just analyzing patients who complete treatment. Um, we're not just analyzing data, uh, patients who don't have missing data, because patients with missing data may be different from patients without missing data. We want to analyze all patients uh, according to their original random assignment. Uh, the challenge, of course, is what do you do with patients with missing data? Uh, well, there are a number of approaches there that generally fall under the idea of imputation. You might be able to impute the missing data based on their previous observations and, and characteristics of the patient. Uh, there's assumptions that go into this, uh, but there are statistical methods that uh, make the assumptions clear and also sort of incorporate the additional uncertainty uh, of those assumptions. So uh, again, this is not something we can go into depth today, but there are statistical methods to handle missing data. Uh, 
Besides the treatment policy approach, there are other, other approaches uh, depending on the situation, and you can explore E9, R1 to hear more about those. Now I'm going to move on to the last topic of this presentation, multiplicity, also known as multiple bites from the apple. And I'm going to use a toy example to introduce this. Uh, so we have a study that consists of flipping a coin four times. Uh, here, heads is a good outcome and tails is a bad outcome. Uh, if we get four heads, we conclude the drug has an effect. If we get one, two, or three heads, we conclude the drug has no effect. Uh, so we do the study, and the first study has three heads, so we conclude the drug has no effect. Uh, but we're not satisfied with the result, so we do it again. And we repeat the study, and here we only get one head, so it's still not good. Uh, we do it again. Here we get two heads, and it's still not good. Uh, it took us 12 times, but eventually we get four heads and we publish the results and say our drug is effective. You know, I, I think you can see sort of the uh, problems with this approach. Multiplicity can come up in, in many ways. Now, the, the example, the toy example I gave on the previous slide is about doing multiple studies. So if you do enough studies, you'll see a result. Uh, but importantly, multiplicity can arise in a single study uh, by looking at multiple subgroups or multiple endpoints. So subgroups might be the effect of males, the effect on females, the effect of people over 65. Uh, multiple endpoints may be the effect of blood pressure, the effect on life expectancy, the effect on happiness. So by looking at multiple things within a single trial, you get the same sort of problem uh, I uh, tried to demonstrate on the last slide. So what are the solutions uh, for multiplicity? Uh, well, the primary solution is pre-specification. You tell the world ahead of time what you will primarily look at. And this is done through protocols and statistical analysis plans. Uh, the protocol should be in place before you start the study. And the excuse me, statistical analysis plan should be in place before the data are unblinded and should follow the, what's already outlined in the protocol. Um, there are statistical methods that do handle or can handle multiple outcomes or subgroups within a trial, uh, which I, of course, won't have time to speak about today, uh, but these need to be pre-specified too. This brings me to the summary. Um, so I hope I you know, convey these principles uh, throughout the presentation, but careful design and conduct are needed for reliable results. Uh, randomization addresses baseline biases. Blinding, good adherence, good follow-up, and good assessment address post-baseline biases. And pre-specification is important to address multiplicity. This brings me to the challenge questions. Uh, challenge question one is, which of the following does not reduce bias? A larger sample size, randomization, blinding the knowledge of the drug from the participants and investigators, pre-specification in the protocol and statistical analysis plan. Give you just a few seconds to think about this. And the answer is a larger sample size. That will reduce variability, uh, but not address biases. That's an important thing to consider. Just making the study larger uh, will not make biases go away. Challenge question two, which of the following addresses multiplicity? We have the same choices, a larger sample size, randomization, blinding the knowledge of the drug from the study participants and investigators, pre-specification in the protocol and statistical analysis plan. And this one I think is more straightforward. I just covered it. And the answer is pre-specification in the protocol and statistical analysis plan. Here are the full titles of the ICH documents that I referenced throughout the presentation.
And finally, let me leave you with this. Good scientific practices, design, conduct, and analysis will promote valid and reliable results. Thank you for your attention, and I will be available for questions at the end of this session. Shabnam and Mark, uh, thank you so much for uh, those presentations. You covered a massive amount of information very clearly. Uh, so hopefully the listeners will find that helpful as well as the resources that you shared. Uh, moving on to the question and answer uh, period. Um, Shabnam, uh, if you're there, we'll, we'll go ahead and start with you. Uh, what information goes into the investigator's brochure? Um, the audience, uh, I think you could probably hear me well. Yes, go ahead. Okay, thanks. Uh, so yeah, we did uh, talk about this. So what goes on the IB and the IB, the investigator brochure is a, you know, important component of um, an IND submission. So it would include a, a brief description of the drug substance and the, and the formulation including the structural formulation. You want to have um, a good summary of pharmacological and, and toxicological effects of the drugs in animals. And if there's any information in, in humans, um, you want to have a summary of the PK and the biological disposition of the drug in, in animals and if known in humans. And then uh, importantly, you do also want to have safety and effectiveness uh, information in, in humans uh, obtained from prior clinical studies. Um, uh, and then also uh, importantly is is uh, having a description of possible risks and and side effects that you anticipate um, based on the prior experience with the drug under investigation or uh, with drugs that are in the same um, uh, pharmacological class and uh, also precautions or, or any kind of special monitoring that you want to have done as part of the uh, investigational use of the drug. Thank you so much, and, and I think that's actually a good introduction to our first session tomorrow. Uh, for those of you who are interested in more detail on this topic, we'll be covering chemistry, manufacturing, and controls, pharm talks, as well as clinical pharmacology in more detail, as uh, so some additional in, insight into what's included in an investigator's brochure. Uh, what, one more question for you, Shabna, for now. Uh, what information should the investigator collect about the serious adverse event to report to the sponsor? Thanks for the question uh, from the audience and from Kim. Um, uh, for So the investigators should collect uh, certain information about the uh, serious adverse event uh, to report to sponsor. And, you know, obviously you'd want to include um, the specified subject, uh, the, the suspected drug, um, and the reporting source. Sometimes it's not the clinical investigators themselves. Uh, you want to have a, a clinical description of the event, um, including an assessment of whether there's a reasonable possibility uh, that the drug caused the event. Um, let me just make sure that you guys can hear me okay. Okay, uh, sorry about that. So yes, you want to have an assessment of um, whether there was a reasonable possibility that the drug caused the event. Uh, so that's a very critical um, element that is very helpful for the for the sponsor um, in their assessment um, as well to determine if it's a, a serious event. Terrific, Over. thanks. Uh, Mark, there, uh, there are some questions for you here as well. Uh, so the first, I'll take a question from the audience here. Uh, blinding, especially double blind, is a staple of the randomized controlled trial to reduce bias. Is there any place for blinding in collecting real world data? Um, well, well, thank you for the question. I think it's a very good question. Um, I have to apologize. I did not attend uh, Dr. John Concato's talk this morning on real world evidence, but I can guess that he made a point that um, FDA considers um, RWE, ran, uh, real world evidence, to include uh, uh, evidence that comes both from um, observational studies as well as clinical trials. Um, in purely observational setting, um, it seems unlikely that you're going to get blinding of the outcome measure. Uh, that's not how medical practice is typically conducted. Uh, 
but in a in a trial setting, in an actual interventional setting, uh, you can conceive that there might be some additional assessments outside uh, the use of real world data, data that's already collected, that could be blinded, and that's probably an effective strategy. Uh, if if uh, a blinded outcome is important, and uh, then it's probably maybe worthwhile in sort of a pragmatic trial setting uh, to do an additional assessment uh, uh, with, a, with a blinded outcome assessment. So I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, another intention to treat a question. Well, if I got one earlier today, there's clearly interest in this area. What is the rationalization for an intention to treat analysis to include patients who may have been switched from one treatment arm to another, such as a patient randomized to an endovascular procedure, but then switched to the medical management arm? It seems that the switch would confound the trial results. Yeah, yeah th th this is a very good question and I think a difficult question to answer, but I'm gonna try. Um, um, I, we in in practice, we don't know if a you know at, at baseline when someone is given a new therapy, we don't know if they're going to switch or not switch. Um, likely, that switch itself will be based on the effect, the, the safety and uh, efficacy of the test drug itself. Uh, so it's kind of hard to separate out the switching uh, from the effect of the drug. Um, now, there are procedures that are proposed to do this, and this is getting more on the research side. Uh, there's what's called per protocol analyses, and there's um, a good paper written on it by Miguel Hernan that tries to use the uh, observed data, both baseline data and post-baseline data of the patient to adjust for the switching and try to sort of get at maybe the true effect of the drug had someone been completely compliant. Uh, but it, it's very challenging to do. I, th I think if it could be done effectively, there'd be a lot of interest in it. Uh, but in practice, you have to know why someone switched. You have to be, you have to have a clear understanding of why someone switched, as well as sort of measure, uh, measure the variables that indicate their propensity for switching. So it, it's, it's very, I think, difficult to do in practice. So um, we, we, ITT is also referred to as treatment policy. It, it's a very simple approach. Like if, if you're, if you give someone a particular treatment and there, you the actual course that follows, whether they stay on the drug uh, or not. Um, if you, um, I'm, I'm getting a little, <clears throat> getting a little roundabout here, but if it, it might it might not make sense to uh, factor out whether someone switches or not because that itself is the effect of the drug. So it's it's a simple way of estimating the effect of the drug, and I, I, I think in many cases very clinically informative. Uh, there may be other estimates that you're interested in, but as I tried to uh, allude earlier, those estimates may be difficult to obtain. And, and just one more thought on this is uh, uh, the reference I see ICH E9R1 may have more to say about this. So thank you. Thanks, Mark. It's really an important topic and, and worthwhile to think through on the front end when you're designing your analytic plan. Uh, Shabnan, question for you. Uh, with respect to the safety factor, would it be prudent to increase the safety factor if the trial is looking at a combination therapy with similar known toxicity? Okay, yeah, thanks for that question. I think uh, we're, we're asking about would it be prudent to increase uh, the safety factor for a combination product, I guess, that has uh, similar known toxicities. and. Um, that's a little tricky. Um, we didn't actually discuss combination products, um, and there's actually several FDA guidances are related to the development of, of combination products. Um, so, uh, but I think the principles are, are somewhat similar, um, you know, in terms of what factors warrant increasing the safety factor. Um, and, uh, you know, with a combination product, you may have had a, a factorial design type of study where you would look at the both, you know, the, the efficacy and then the safety of, of the single products alone administered alone and then the safety of the combination, you know, product. So, and that would be done in, in non-clinical um, 
uh, species as well. So keeping that in mind, you know, um, as I said, the, the factors that would warrant increasing the safety factor for a single product would probably be pretty similar for combination as well, I would guess. And, you know, those would be, um, you can consider with an, with whether any of the ones that are, um, you know, listed in that guidance um, on estimating the maximum starting dose in, in first in human studies would apply to that combination product. So, you know, just as an example, um, you could, uh, ask yourself if the toxicities may be expected to be greater, um, again, than the uh, single product administered alone. You could um, think about whether there would be qualitative um, uh, severe toxicities or, or damage to any particular organ system, um, which may make you warrant, may, which may warrant increasing the safety factor. Uh, again, you would, you know, kind of look at non-monitorable toxicities or toxicities that don't have any um, pre-monetary signs, um, irrever irreversible toxicities, or even unexplained mortality as examples um, for warranting um, an increase in the safety factor. Thank you so much. One uh, more question for you while I have you. Uh, is there a predetermined limit or threshold for unexpected toxicity observed during a clinical trial that would necessitate updating the investigator's brochure for an uh, investigational drug? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and I'm not sure what's meant by specific thresholds, but I think we would just have to go back to our definition of what's considered unexpected um, as far as an adverse event or a suspected adverse reaction. And, you know, those are, again, uh, if it's not listed in the investigator brochure, if it's not at the listed at the specificity or the severity that's been observed, um, if you don't have an investigational brochure, if it's not required. Um, and then, again, if it's not consistent with the um, risk information that's described in the general investigational plan or elsewhere in the current application, and then um, finally, you know, unexpected also refers to um, uh, uh, adverse events or suspected adverse events that are mentioned in the IB as occurring with a class of drugs um, or anticipated from the pharmacological properties of the drug, but are not specifically mentioned um, as occurring with a particular drug under investigation. Great, I hope that answers the question. Thanks. Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, Mark, a couple of additional questions for you. Um, in planning a clinical trial, we often do power calculations. Can you explain the role of power calculations in the design of clinical trials? Okay, I'll, I'll try in the, in the few minutes we have left. Uh, um, a, a topic I didn't have time to cover is like is hypothesis testing. Uh, you probably have come across it in some form or another. Uh, but typically, trials are designed around hypotheses to uh, demonstrate or, uh, that a drug has an effect. And um, the, the way that typically works is we have the alpha level, uh, which is sort of the probability of declaring that the drug has an effect when it really doesn't. And that's where we see values like 0.05 or two-sided 0.05. Um, so we that sort of fixed ahead of time, um, say 0.025, that would be the probability of declaring the drug as an effect uh, when it really doesn't. Uh, power is sort of the other side of that. Uh, given that we fix that alpha and the drug does have an effect, um, usually that's uh, specified uh, based on clinical justification, what would be sort of a clinically expected or reasonable effect that this drug would have. So given that effect, we want to have the sample size such that there's a um, good probability, usually 80 or 90%, uh, that the trial will declare that the drug has an effect. Uh, so typically, that's how we plan sample sizes. We pick an alpha uh, based on sort of regulatory precedent or, or the therapeutic precedent, and then we adjust sample size um, and that's the power calculation. We adjust sample size. So given that the drug has an effect, that we have a reasonable probability of detecting that effect. Um, so I hope that's somewhat helpful. And I, I think ICHD9 may have more to say about that as well. Thanks so, Mark. Thanks so much, Mark, and also Shabnan for uh, your responses today.
also for the really uh, informative uh, presentations. Um, we'll go ahead and, and wrap this up. I'm going to hand the mic over to Leonard for some closing remarks for today. Thank you all. Uh, well, thanks very much, uh, Kim, for leading the discussion, and uh, thanks to uh, to Mark and Shabnam for great presentations. It's been a fairly intense agenda today, and we finished with some of the very critical areas in clinical trial design and execution, which are basically safety and the statistic principles that help us interpret the data. So I also want to thank the audience for their excellent questions. Uh, tomorrow we'll resume at 11 Eastern time, and we'll be starting with a focus on basic science. We'll be talking about uh, chemistry, manufacturing controls, toxicology, and clinical pharmacology, which are all very important uh, in the investigator's brochure. And then we'll pivot to uh, another area of great importance, which is the investigator responsibilities and inspections. And finally, we'll end with a talk on international trials. So uh, that brings us to the end of today's agenda. And before I hand over to Ray for some uh, administrative uh, comments, I just want to take the opportunity to thank you all, to wish you a good evening wherever you are, and we look forward to resuming tomorrow, uh, tomorrow morning. Thank you.